there, uh, probably from a few weeks ago. Um, we're running a, a series of talks where they're heavily kind of, well, for lack of a better word, plagiarised because of health conditions that have been going on. So as usual, most of this is not entirely my own work, but it is uh, a high trust going to be helpful as we look at that passage because it was a bit tricky, wasn't it? How do you respond to a passage like that? I wonder if you've ever ended up somewhere where you weren't supposed to be, uh, ended up maybe you made a wrong turn, you didn't realise where you were heading, maybe it's because your navigational skills are a little bit poor, maybe because you're a sat-nav driver and then it stopped working and then all of a sudden you're like, where am I? What do I do now? Uh, a month or two ago I was um, driving down to Southampton, as you all know I've been doing quite a bit, uh, and safely I was talking on the phone uh, through a hands-free thing, but that meant I was watching the road, thinking about the conversation and not watching the sat-nav, and all of a sudden there was like, I don't recognise this bit of road. Where am I? And that momentary uh, lack of concentration cost me an extra hour's worth of journey as I ended up going via Reading to get to Southampton. I remember thinking to myself this question, how on earth did that happen? How did I get here? And that's a, a, a silly little situation, but that could be, very easily be the, pass, the question asked of this passage that we've just read. How did David get here? How on earth did David, Philistine-slaying, God-trusting David, find himself lining up alongside the Philistines and the king of the Philistines thinking, he'll be my servant forever, look what he's done. Surely David is better than that. What happened? Well, in one sense, we should have semi-seen it coming. Um, remember, David has already talked about being considered, considering himself to be a forced exile in the last chapter. He has already tried to join the Philistines once for his own safety. And let's face it, humanly speaking, we couldn't really blame him. He's been hunted, he's been tracked, he's been attacked by Saul, he's been treacherously exposed, he's made thrilling escapes and executed daring escapades in camps of sleeping soldiers. We followed David through 11 chapters of high blood pressure narrative, haven't we? It's the kind of stuff that makes great movies, but it takes its toll on real people. And in that sense, the Bible is deeply honest and realistic. If we come to the Bible looking for sentimentality or romantic heroism, or this perfect figure in all the heroes, we are going to be disappointed. Because the Bible is about real people and a real God. Real people have weaknesses as well as strengths. They have failures as well as successes, and defeats as well as triumphs. And yet the real God, while perfect in every way, doesn't turn us away, doesn't abandon us, doesn't give up. No, he deals with real people who do not always find his ways comfortable. And David is one of those real people whose story the Bible tells. We've seen dark moments, haven't we? We know he bitterly regretted um, cutting off the corner of Saul's robe in the cave. We've witnessed his violent anger against Nabal and his determination to take vengeance against him. That was wrong. Okay, yes, he didn't do it because he was persuaded by the courageous, prophetic, and wise and not to mention beautiful Abigail. We've seen those dark moments, but we have kind of got to a point where despite those moments, we had concluded at the end of the last chapter that David is described by these words, righteousness and faithfulness. They have described him well as he's learnt, as he's developed as a leader. They matched the young man who commended David to Saul back in chapter 16, saying he is a brave man. Did I put this in? No, I didn't. He's a brave man and a fine warrior. He speaks well. And he is a fine-looking man. And the Lord is with him. That much has been clear. It has been clear 
And David has acknowledged the Lord's care, protection, and enabling. And David, at his best, knew that, depended on that, and made his decisions based on it. But, then chapter 27, where we see the beginning of David disappearing off to join the Philistines. Uh, 20, chapter 27 is not a complete story. We'll have, you'll have to read the rest of the book in the next few weeks. We're going to look at chapters 28 and 30 in about three weeks' time. But it's rather a weird thing. We've got these sections. We've got David's plan and this thing about David's town and then his practice. But all of which seem to happen with no mention of God himself or his plan or the purposes that he's working through it. And the other interesting thing is there's no moral commentary from the writer. They're just recorded for us. And they're a bit bleak. How is David's activity here to be evaluated? Well, one of the commentaries I was reading this week concluded this way. He said, I would say that the text is sympathetic to David's difficulties and yet presents him as wrong in his understanding. David is acting incorrectly. It's not justifying his conduct. The Bible is real. And yet as we look at this passage, I've got three things that I want to suggest are three truths and three directions that God gives to his people through watching this incident. The first of those is this. Learn to lean on your true security. At the end of chapter 26, we saw one of the high points in the difficult days for David. He's confronted Saul, they've parted ways, and yet we turn into chapter 27, and David's thoughts take a rather unexpected turn. David comes up with a plan from a position of a, what looks like a fainting faith. He's quite convinced that his only security rests in taking the matter into his own hands, approaching the very enemies he'd successfully fought on Israel's behalf, and offering them his services. Look with me at verse 1. David thought to himself, one of these days I shall be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. The puzzle with David's words is that he imagines the hand of Saul will prevail. His experience through these admittedly difficult days has been that Saul sought him every day and God did not give him into his hand. What would, make, what would David now think? Why would, make, why would he now think that God's protection of him would one day fail? And the exact answer is we don't know. But the words he uses are interesting because he uses the word perish or swept away about how he, he will be swept away, which hints at the depth of his anguish and is also the same as he uses of how God, in the previous chapter, how God would surely dispose of Saul in his time. It looks like he's giving up and just letting Saul's evil intentions win. David has described them in the previous chapter as driving him away from the Lord's inheritance and to be far from the presence of the Lord. And at this point, he looks for security in Philistia rather than looking to God. Why are we told this? Well, David obviously has this special place in history and particularly in the history of God's plan of salvation but we see also that he shares common dilemmas with all of the Lord's people. You see, at this point, David's heart desires freedom from the fear of Saul more than he desires faithfulness to God. And when we desire something like that, it's very easy to, to live out this uh, phrase that uh, Thomas Cranmer came up with. He said, what the heart desires, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And we can see why this made sense to David. Practically speaking, David and his men have wives and households. The number of spies giving away his position means they probably daren't leave them behind. They need to take them with them. They need somewhere safe. Who knows? There were 600 men. 
wives and children, that's a lot of people to look after. The sheer logistics of safety and provision for the families must have weighed heavily on David. And then we read verse 4. When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. You see, this practical solution that David's come up has worked. And we could read it as being some kind of validation of David's plan. But David being in Gath is not the faithful result God wanted. David seems to have forgotten God's direct command to him, recorded in chapter 22, to go to the land of Judah. God wanted David to be his man in Judah. But, as we said, David shares common dilemmas that we may even feel. We we might not wrestle with covenant kingship, that we might not be the potential king of God's people, and so us messing up might not look so bad on the stage. But I'm pretty sure we probably all know the subtle danger of leaning on something else that is less than the everlasting arms of God. Our concerns are often practical, like David. But that's not commended to us. No, we're meant to lean on our true security. So the question is, is there any way that I might be deceiving myself by trusting in a substitute? How can I, how should I go on learning about God? How do we avoid this David situation here? Well, actually, I think the answer is in the way verse 1 is put. Translating the first few words literally, it says, David, Then David said to his heart, One of these days I shall be destroyed by the hand of Saul. And the action we're meant to take is to do that, but with the right messages. That is, talk to, talk, talking the truth about God to ourselves. Remind ourselves who God is and what he's doing, what promises he has made, what promises he has kept. Because what we say and keep saying to the center of our lives will direct our way. We all do it all the time. We talk to ourselves. We maybe don't do it out loud. But it's crucial to feed our souls the right truth the truth, especially about the adequacy of our God. In 1854, Charles Spurgeon was in his first year of ministry in London and cholera had struck. Uh, One family after another called him to the bedside of their loved ones and almost daily he stood by a grave. At first he threw himself into his visits to the sick with all his youthful energy, but soon, however, Uh, uh, weary in body and sick at heart, he began to think he was about to succumb himself. He was on the great Dover Road, dragging himself home from a funeral, when he noticed what he thought was an advertisement in a shop window. But on closer inspection, he saw the words from Psalm 91, written at the center of the poster. This is the, the, the NIV rendering of that. But if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. And these words immediately encouraged him. He reported this, Faith appropriated the passage as her own. I felt secure, refreshed. I went on with my visitation of the dying in a calm and peaceful spirit. We need to speak God's truth in scripture to ourselves and to each other, don't we? We need to let the faith, which is a gift of God, appropriate God's words as as our own. We need to guard against the lies and misinformation that we tell ourselves, that we feed our hearts on. Because ultimately, Jesus, who has saved us and forgiven us, has given us his spirit to be able to live in a way that pleases him. When we're tempted to think that we know best, that God has no idea how we're feeling, 
Maybe you need to remember God has already done everything to save us, and he knows what we're going through. Hebrews 12 says this. Oops. No, I, apparently I didn't put that one in, sorry. He says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We need to remind ourselves, we need to lean on our true security. This episode teaches an important lesson. God, in his mercy and grace, can still choose to bless a situation, though. Here, through Saul no longer seeking David, even when he doesn't approve of the methods. However, it is vital that we grasp this and learn the craft of wisdom. That's the second point. J.I. Packer helpfully said this, God has blessed his people before through intrinsically inappropriate arrangements. And he may do so again. His mercy in practice does not settle matters of principle any more than majority votes do. You see, at this point, part one of David's plan is complete. Uh, so far, so good. Perhaps David's men and their families enjoyed their first sound sleep in months. Gath may be Philistine, but it certainly beats a cave. But now, though, he needs the breathing space, and he pushes on further. Um, uh, I need to get this space from someone who is ultimately his enemy. And so he asks Akish for somewhere else to live. Verse 5. I have, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag. And it has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. You see, again, not to commend what David does, but through his deception, he acquires this town. We're told it belongs to his line of kings in, in, in perpetuity. That request does work. He's granted Ziklag, and David enjoys freedom and security. And the deception works. From there, David can attack Israel's enemies, thus helping Israel, while alleging that he's attacking Israelite territory. The whole scheme, in one sense, is a masterstroke. It is not faithful, but it is successful. And so when we face situations, we need to ask the question, what is it that we should do? We may be reminded of the word, these words from Proverbs 13. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. See, it's not that David didn't think, he surely is a thinker. In fact, if we think a bit about, how, about David's thinking, maybe we can understand his conclusions. Tiredness from endless opposition and danger must have weighed him down. But then David's plan works too well. Akish becomes a believer in David. I, he will be my servant forever. And he insists then into chapter 28 that David and his men fight with his troops against Israel. It's so easy to make a turn, ask why, how did I get here when we're not walking wisely? David's dilemma is if he marches with the Philistines, he'll lose credibility to say the least in Israel. His decision has led him to a point where he is, in one sense, risking his kingship over Israel. Saul may not be so nasty or so damaging in the long run as being dubbed a traitor. And did you wince as we saw how David described himself to Achish? Your servant? But with where he is now, if he, on the other hand, plays false at some point with Achish and the Philistines, well, then he might find that they're more efficient at disposing of him than Saul has been. Trying to avoid taking cheap shots at David then, because he is in awful positions that probably we can't imagine. 
we also do need to not ignore the important point of the story. The will of God for us, for his people, includes more than escaping from Saul. No one disputes here the malice of Saul or pretends that escaping him or the last few chapters have been some merry journey. And it's hard to see uh, such difficulties in what we're doing when immediate emergencies loom so large. It's really easy to drop into an if only, isn't it? If only this problem wasn't right now pressing on me, monopolizing my thinking, consuming my energy. If only I could get relief from, I would get on well and I'd be able to do what is better. Well, as I was reading, the recurring phrase that came back was people, well, I don't have a magical formula for this. There's nothing obvious, but what we need is the Bible's perspective and principles for facing circumstances. That's why it's the craft of wisdom. So we could think about Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. But we need to remember that the text does not say don't use your understanding but it says don't lean on it. Lean on the Lord. Use your understanding. Don't lean on your understanding and use the Lord. But there's no instant insight. There's no quick fix. We need to be studying the word. We need to be depending on our Savior. And we can remember, too, that our teacher is more patient and merciful than Saul or Achish are. So to learn the craft of wisdom, we need to read scripture. We need to listen to scripture. We need to let faith take its words and apply it to our own situations. So Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isaiah declares this in chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We need to lean on our true security. We need to learn the craft of wisdom. And then final point, we need to latch on to grace. And there's a warning for these last few verses of the chapter, isn't there? They are something that our 21st century sensibilities find hard to read. David is playing a dangerous game in an attempt to make the most of a bad situation. And to his shame, he does so in a brutal and deceitful manner. His practice is ruthless. Verse 8, now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the, uh, the, the, Girizite, the Girzites and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people had lived in the land extending to Shur and Egypt. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but took sheep and cattle, donkeys and camels and clothes. Then he returned to Achish. Now, it's not abundantly clear, again, from the text, what motivates this ruthless butchery. Some see it as David fulfilling what Saul had failed to do. Saul had been tasked by God to destroy the Amalekites for what had been done to Israel on the way out of Egypt. But Saul hadn't followed God's instructions and had spared some. The result, God rejected Saul as king of Israel. 
But if David is attacking these peoples in order to obey God's command, then he's no more obedient than Saul because he too fails to follow God's instructions to the letter. He too keeps back livestock and clothing. Some see David's motivation as a bit more opportunistic and pragmatic. David, it's argued, is simply keeping Achish sweet, providing food for his army and their families, protecting Israel and leaving no survivors, not because this is God's command, but because it is the only way he can continue his deception. The fact that David weakens Israel's enemies in the process is merely the added bonus. Whatever the reason is, we definitely see here the Bible is an honest book. Sympathetic that we might be to maybe David's mental health, the writer does not hide how calculating and ruthless David was while he was a Philistine. David the raider is one thing to hear. David the butcher is another. And in these verses, David seems to be practicing overkill, even by the customs of the time. I don't know, how did you react as we read it? Maybe you were puzzled. Maybe you were angry. Maybe you were disappointed. Is David now a disappointing soul-like king? Has this whole journey been for nothing? Well, the Bible gives us this because, well, the truth is that most of God's servants will do something disappointing at some time. A lot of this was left, uh, I've kind of used, particularly the headings were kind of lifted out of Dale Ralph Davies' commentary on 1 Samuel. And he helpfully suggests that these descriptions are here not to correct David on that score, but to correct us. He writes this. Yes, you, Bible reader that you are, may have fallen into the trap of hero worship, of looking on your pet Bible characters and exalting them too highly. Why should you be surprised, shocked, offended? Why should you talk about betrayal? The text is saying that this chosen anointed servant is made of the same stuff as all the Lord's people. Must we throw out God's kingdom because not only its subjects, but even its premier servants are sinners? You see, we're not meant to take away a black and white, the black and white view of Saul bad, David good. The brilliantly gifted David was also a man with a nature like ours. In himself, he was more than capable of doubting God, of giving way to fear, of taking self-protective action with no reference to God. The alarming conclusion, if we've understood this chapter fairly, is that David possessed all the weaknesses that led to Saul's downfall. And so we must latch on to how God works through grace. The Bible does not claim that God's servants are dipped in vanish or oxyclean or silly bang so that they will be infallibly sin-free and attractive. The living God does not have clean material to work with. Maybe you like it when we sing songs maybe that mention how uh, he is the potter and we are the clay. But we need to remember that the clay he's working with is sinful clay. And it's not our place to criticize the potter because of the clay, but rather marvel that he stoops to work with such stuff. You know, whenever we entertain, no matter how subtly, some idea that we're worthy of God, we won't understand the Bible. We won't understand grace. We won't fear God in that right sense of who he is. And we'll not delight in the way he works. But if we latch on to grace, we'll see that's how he works. That's why David is not erased from these pages like Saul has been from this point. He's, Dave, Saul kind of steps out and he only comes back for us to witness his death. Maybe we'd have liked to place ourselves in David's sandals all the way through this story 
uh, uh, through this book. Do you want to put yourself in his shoes now? This is the point where we really are in David's sandals at the end of the passage. We are stand before a proverbial Akish, maybe. In trouble so far up to our neck that we can't see a way out. Well, God always provides a way out. It's never too late. If that's us, if we have made these foolish calls, we've run our own way, we've not trusted our chief security, we've not made wise decisions, and we're standing thinking we're doomed. Well, the gospel calls us to put our trust in Jesus, in whom is to be found truth and life. There are no lies with him. There's no ruthless coming, uh, cunning, just righteousness and faithfulness. And he wants us to return to him now. It's never too late to grasp the grace that is on offer. As we're going to see in the coming chapters, despite David having this crisis of faith, God graciously continues to protect him in fulfillment of his purpose to make him king. Because God's purposes are more than just surviving Saul. And God wants to fulfill his purposes in your life too. The really good news is that even when our faith, like David's, fails, God remains faithful. I'm sure many of us can relate to uh, feeling, that feeling of being so weary that we just want to kind of give up, take matters into our own hands. Maybe you've known or have been a young Christian committed to living their life for Christ with Jesus their king, committed to live countercultural lives, saying no to pornography or no to sex before marriage, no to inappropriate relationships, no to drugs, no to gossip, theft, lies. And then one day being weary and in a moment of weakness, they listen to their own voice, not God's. And that commitment and zeal to follow God is just cast aside in a moment. And as in David's case, it might not be instant disaster, but that small compromise leads to a bigger one, which left unchecked leads to danger. Maybe we're married or you know, have been in a season in which, humanly speaking, marriage was on the brink of disaster. For so long as we've been faithful, sorry, for so long we've been faithful to our spouse, pursued biblical principles in the marriage, but right now we're weary. The commitment maybe is questioning. What about the, if we're weary of being single? Maybe we just had enough of waiting and trusting that God knows what he's doing with circumstances beyond our control. What about if we're just tired of being ridiculed at school or work because of our faith? Maybe for so long we've been trying to live for Christ, watching our language, watching our gossip, but right now we're so weary that we just want to fit in. We need to learn from David's mistakes here. We need to lean on our true security. We need to learn the craft of wisdom. We need to latch on to grace. Or we'll end up asking, how did I get there? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the brutal honesty of your word, that it shows us uh, who we are and that we're all made of the same stuff, that we don't deserve your favor we don't deserve your grace. And yet because of your goodness and your mercy, you have sent us a saviour who has redeemed us, who has brought us back, who has paid our debts and forgiven us. And so, Lord, we pray you'd help us to live as wise people, even when pushed to extremity, 
in our lives. Help us to lean on you, our true security. Help us to learn the craft of wisdom as you teach us by your spirit through the word. Help us to latch on to grace, which is the way you work in all things. Amen.